my talk today is uh, how olive oil and corporate excess can help save the world. I omitted the word help. I think this was my unconscious uh, working here because I'm so excited about being here in TED. Uh, so I apologize for that. I also realized that it's the last uh, talk of the day and probably you're all thirsty and hungry. So uh, just bear with me and I think it'll help us relate to the numbers that I'm going to show you right now. The situation of the world today for many people is very difficult. One in every two people living in the world today is living under two euros a day of, of income. 20% of all children are living without any access to safe running water. 2.2 million children die every single year for the sheer fact of not being able to be inoculated with vaccines. And in maybe the minute that I've just been talking, 10 children have just died. One billion people have entered the 21st century being completely illiterate. And 72 to 1 is the difference between the richest and the poorest countries today. A huge difference from 200, 200 years ago, where this was more a 3 to 1 ratio. So the situation is really dire for many people, although we don't see it so close to us. And olive oil can help. Now, for those of you that aren't Spanish or those of you that are looking uh, through the internet and don't understand the overwhelming uh, power of a great olive oil, uh, let me tell you a little story. Uh, three years ago, you know, two and a half years ago, my business partner, Eduardo Jimenez, um, is vice president of a small NGO that works in Uganda with, uh, with orphans, and uh, he helps integrate orphans uh, with uh, richer kids from, from other schools through artistic expression, theater, etc. And um, an olive oil manufacturer approached him uh, and was really charmed by the project. We really wanted to do something to help develop this project further. But unfortunately, they didn't have money. Uh, what they did have was uh, 20,000 uh, liters or so of olive oil that they had manufactured in excess and that they weren't able to sell and that they offered uh, to Eduardo to you know, do something uh, with it if, if it were possible. And that's when Eduardo called me and uh, we got together and we tried to think about, well, you know, how can we utilize this olive oil uh, for, for this NGO? Um, obviously, the economic value of 20,000 liters of olive oil is quite high. It was, it was a tremendous impact for the project. But we encountered uh, very serious obstacles. What we saw was that neither our, neither our NGO nor any other NGO, uh, for that matter, in Spain, uh, could really utilize this, this sort of um, donation in kind because of the very high transportation costs and the logistics involved. Just bringing this olive oil to Madrid, to the headquarters, was very expensive. But bringing that to Uganda was absolutely ludicrous. And secondly, even if we were able to bring it there, the low product utility for the projects being developed in Kampala uh, really you know, didn't make it very meaningful. We could end up with a ridiculous situation where, at best, we would have you know, a, a rudimentary form of exercise for the third world, but uh, nothing much more uh, productive. So we tried to survey and we asked all of the large NGOs here in Spain, you know, what do you do when you're encountered with these problems? And they all unanimously answered the same thing. Well, we, we, we really can't do anything. Um, there are no mechanisms to transform donations in kind into, um, there we go, into um, monetary funds, something that can be really useful for development. So we started thinking and we saw, well, you know, th this is a situation that really affects not only us, but the whole third sector. And uh, instead of just staying there and leaving the company um, you know, on its own, we thought, well, why don't we transform the system and make it productive somehow? Not only for olive oil to be useful, but for many other products and services that companies are developing in surplus and that they're you know, warehousing and they're having to destroy at a cost. And why don't we make this something useful for development? And that's how we started SocialBid two and a half years ago. Uh, which is the company that I've been dedicating my time to. SocialBid's model is basically to integrate the third sector with the private sector and try to um, obtain donations in kind uh, and transform that into monetary funds, incentivizing all of the actors involved um, through different incentives that make them want to participate. So firstly, we have the NGOs, to whom we offer a new source of fund uh, funding without any investment involved in human resources or economically. 
Secondly, we put them in touch with donors, which are mainly companies or individuals, uh, mainly celebrities, who donate products, services, or experiences uh, to these NGOs through social bid. What we do is we put them in touch with customers, the buyers, through the internet, uh, who are willing to buy these products at a, at a low cost, and at the same time have the satisfaction of knowing that all of their, their money is going towards funding development projects. So we're helping them, the, the citizen sector, um, get involved with development, with making this world a better place without an extra cost, just to, you know, through their own consumption patterns. All of this is done through the internet and recently we're starting a new mobile channel through mobile phones. So this was our model, this was our dream, and we started it and fortunately, two, two and a half years afterwards, um, it's been quite successful. We have more than 50 companies that have donated products and services to uh, more than 50 NGOs, amongst which are uh, the, main, uh, the main NGOs working here in Spain, as well as 150 celebrities that have dedicated their time or products, uh, memorabilia, etc. Through this, we've made a, our dream a reality, and not, not only is olive oil now something that can be very useful for development projects, but many other things as well. So in this way, we've been able to sell iPods for example, to develop schools in Mali. We've been able to sell art from famous, famous, famous Spanish uh, painters uh, to develop refugee camps in Ethiopia and a few other countries in Africa. We've sold hotel nights, excess capacity of hotel nights in Mallorca. And with this, we've been able to uh, create a more sustainable marine development of the, of the Balearic Islands. And we've sold many celebrity items, such as the uh, yellow maillot of the winner of the Tour de France uh, last year, uh, to develop projects to integrate socially excluded children through sports. So all in all, um, it's been more than 10,000 products, services, and experiences that we've sold in these two and a half years, um, which has represented uh, 600,000 euros of new funding for the third sector, funding that was previously unavailable and that would have been just uh, wasted. Or how I prefer to look at it, five thousand children, thanks to this, these two and a half years of work, um, that are you know with uh, families that, are, that have no structure, have been able to uh, be um, involved in a family education lodging through Aldeas Infantiles, or we've been able to finance two thousand seven hundred new hospital beds in Africa for a full year. Why has this been so successful? Well, it's developing on a trend that, um, that's been going on in Spain as well as many other countries. Um, I haven't said this before, but this model is, is pretty unique. Um, we've started here in Spain because this is where I live, but our plans are to expand it around the world. What's happening is that many NGOs, the third sector in general, is trying to increase its financing to have a larger impact through private sources of funding uh, after the state has, you know, pretty much become more stagnated. Uh, this, comes more, uh, this comes through two different uh, channels, mostly through the corporate sector, uh, which has been developing a, a new notion of corporate social responsibility. Com companies are increasingly aware of their responsibility in making this world a better place, in, in developing a more sustainable environment around their activity, as well as individuals who are increasingly becoming responsible through their consumption patterns, through volunteering, etc., with uh, the situation, the globalized situation that we're living today that we've seen before. So this is great news. Uh, we, have, we have really an unprecedented opportunity to make this world a better place for many, many other people, something that we didn't have 100 years ago, involving more sectors of society. And this reminds me of the talk uh, of Nicolas before, where, uh, where, where he was talking about crowdfunding for, for, for cinemas. This, this is a, an opportunity to increase the potential impact of, of the third sector. But what we do have to you know, get involved in right now is to build bridges between these three sectors, to develop innovative opportunities for these sectors to interact and to be incentivized to interact in a sustainable, in a sustainable way and in a current way. Social bid is just one of these examples, and there are many more, fortunately. For example, Thorkel Son, a peer of mine, he's from Denmark, and he's created a company called Specialist Stern. It's a company that hires autistic people for uh, software development. It's a for-profit company, and uh, through this company, he's made 
possible to take a marginalized sector of society and make them not only included in the, in the workforce, but also just even more so uh, to make them really competitive. It's a very successful company because autistic people are better at certain routine uh, software testing, quality control tasks. And this is going really well and he's expanding this to the world. His, his uh, plan is to have one million autistic people working in companies productively. Another example. Fabio Luiz, this, uh, he's from Brazil and he created an, uh, an organization called Ideas. He had a dream to bring electricity to many people in Brazil, in rural areas, poorer people that didn't have access to the, to the normal uh, electricity grid. And he created an innovative way to bring electricity to these areas that was cheap for them, 30% of the normal cost of electricity, and at the same time, it was profitable for the electricity companies. Through Fabio's work, one million Brazilians now have access to electricity, running water and telecommunications where they didn't have access before. So these are just three examples, but they're, they're examples of social entrepreneurs, uh, some, a concept that's becoming increasingly popular in, 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 in today's time. Social entrepreneurs are people that identify sectors of society that are underserved by the current institutions and that want to do something about it, and they create an innovative model to serve these needs better. Or in the words of Bill Drayton, uh, the founder and CEO of Ashoka, one of the leading foundations that support social entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs are not just content to give fish or to teach how to fish. They won't rest until they really revolutionize the, fish, the fishing in industry. And this really t tells a lot about how social entrepreneurs work. So fortunately, this is a trend that's been growing, and I think that it's been growing for a reason that's quite personal in nature, and that's something that's been, that I think will be shaping the way that we view our jobs and our careers in the next 10 years. You know, humankind has been looking for external givers of meaning for a long time. You know, what was once God, then later became science, and more recently, you know, this until the 19th century. More recently, this has been conferred to the role of mega corporations, huge corporations. Huge corporations have been giving many people a productive sense of being in the world, and at the same time incentivizing them with two of the most coveted uh, metrics, or um, yeah, metri metrics uh, here today, which is wealth and social prestige. Again, fortunately, this has been changing quite recently for two main reasons. On the first hand, Many individuals, young professionals, successful young professionals, are being able to reach and to obtain these socially given metrics at an earlier age. And therefore, they're learning that once achieved this wealth and success that society has really commanded them to obtain, they're not really finding much more meaning in their lives. They're not feeling much more fulfilled. At the same time, and this has been very recent due to the economic downturn, we've seen this quite, quite well. Very large corporations, for example, one of the, uh, some of the largest investment banks that could have been considered gods in the 80s, have been failing us, have been crashing. You know, they are not um, permanent givers of, of guarantees. And this has led to another, another effect of corporate excess which has been shifting the focus more from external givers of meaning to something that we've been seeing before in one of our previous uh, TED Talks, to a more individualistic and more authentic sense of being, where one really questions what is what, what, what's going to fulfill one, one's life and tries to develop a career around it. Fortunately today, where uh, uh, this is very different from a few years ago, Young professionals are reaching this stage at a time where they can not only reevaluate their values, but they can also create a new career around these new values uh, where they can fulfill themselves. This midlife crisis is becoming a quarter life crisis, and there's a whole website of, of people experiencing this right now. And this is leading to many young professionals who can afford the, the, the luxury to be able to think about these issues, to look for careers that are much more adapted to their strengths and interests. This is something that another former tester, Martin Seligman, a positive psychologist, was talking about. He was saying, well, uh, it's studied that wealth and social prestige do not, do not affect long-term happiness. Whereas, a career that's oriented towards one's talents does. Secondly, work-life balance, something that was unheard of 50 years ago, is becoming increasingly important for people. As well as 
using one's talents towards the service of others and the realization that that brings to the individual. Finally, entrepreneurship is also gaining importance as a means of taking one's interests and one's, one's self-fulfillment in, in one's own hands. So I think this is a very positive trend that's going on on a personal level and uh, that's, bringing, that's bringing a lot of uh, people to really question uh, what, what they've been commanded by society and what they really want. And this is certainly my case. I studied economics and I worked at two of the most uh, prestigious investment banks in the world and also a, a, very, a, a very coveted uh, management consulting company. And the difference has, has been so huge when I've really found my true self in, in my new job. And this is bringing a structural change that I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of uh, in 10 years, which is just the development of social entrepreneurship as a sector. It's a very new thing, but it's growing ra quite rapidly, and the impact is already very strong. Just looking at Ashoka entrepreneurs, I'm a fellow of Ashoka, so I know this more closely. 93% of Ashoka entrepreneurs, they pursue their original objective 10 years after starting. These are people that are really dedicated to their jobs, that r are really interested in what they do. 83% of them have been able to change the system at a national level in the first 10 years of activity. 80% are considered leaders in their field. And 90% or more of them have had their ideas already replicated by external groups, increasing their impact in a, in a sort of uh, democratic way in, in the, the first uh, 10 years of activity. So I think this is great news. I think this is very inspiring, at least for me, uh, in terms of what we can do to make this world a better place. And this is leading to a very, very strong growth of social entrepreneurship. As you can see here, the number of international citizen groups has been growing exponentially in the last, in the last uh, 15 years. And also, new uh, organizations are springing up to help support these social entrepreneurs in, the, in their role, uh, especially in their initial stages, like Ashoka, like Skoll Foundation, like the Acumen Fund, and like uh, the Hub that has kindly invited us today to talk here. So I think this is a great, great, great uh, opportunity, and uh, I would like to just conclude my talk by inviting all of you to take, if possible, an hour of your time at one point when you're you know, calm and, and, and really think about two main questions regarding your careers and the way you're, you're, you're looking at your jobs. The first is, am I really happy with what I'm doing? Am I really using my main talents? Am I really you know, thriving off what I, what, what, I, what I live off? And secondly, is there any way that I can put my talents towards the service of others? I think this is a very important question and that cannot be disregarded. Uh, I think that if you ask this question and you cannot obtain two affirmative answers, I strongly urge you to reconsider the way you're viewing your career and to think about if there's any way that you can, you can shift it. Even if you think it's too late, it really never is too late. And I'm, I can assure you, the stakes are quite high because this is your personal fulfillment that we're talking about, your personal happiness, and maybe more importantly, the lives uh, of others that just for, for sheer fortune, have not had the luck that we have and that have been born into a world that's much more difficult than ours. So anyway, thank you very, very much for your time. And, um